Asia Society members and everyone around the world, I'm Sarah Wei, an arts and travel writer here in Asia Society's Hong Kong Center. I'm happy to introduce the Joyful Readers Community um, project, bringing you wellness, our wellness guidebook, a digital catalog and four part series featuring leading authors from around the globe who delve into topics of spirituality, mental health and wellness. Thanks to the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust for supporting the series. Our first session today will be with Dupanka Aaron on his newly released book, On the Trail of Buddha, A Journey to the East. His book documents a pilgrimage of the East connecting cultural and ancient civilizations, spanning temples and monasteries from India, China, Mongolia, Korea to Japan. Dupanka Aaron is a passionate traveler, photographer and writer, a graduate from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and holds a presidential award for his contribution to the Indian Revenue Service. On the Trail of Buddha, A Journey to the East is his second book after World Her Heritage Sites of Uttraha, a guide to the natural beauties of the Valley of Flowers and Nanda Devil National Parks. Now living in the Himalayan highlands, his story continues as an advocate for spiritual travel and cultural exchange. Dipanka will now take us through his journey and we'll then follow with a Q&A. So send in your questions during the stream via Facebook and YouTube Live. Take it away, Dipanka. Uh, hello, uh, hello everyone from Hong Kong, from all across the world. At the outset, it's, it's a great pleasure to be back to Hong Kong, though virtually. And uh, uh, it's almost after six years uh, since I left Hong Kong after having worked there as three, for three years as, as, as a diplomat in the Consulate General of India in Hong Kong. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Asia Society Hong Kong, uh, particularly Alice Mong, uh, Stanley Kong, Sarah Wei, and the whole team behind. Uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, diplomatic mission in Hong Kong, the Council General of India, where I worked, as also the diplomatic missions of India in Beijing, in uh, Tokyo, in Seoul, and elsewhere. And of course, the wonderful people of Hong Kong, uh, uh, without whom this work wouldn't have really happened. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the, uh, a brief uh, a slide presentation about the book, and let's start right away. So... Uh, the book's taken almost about 11 years to happen. Uh, it includes six years of travels and uh, five years of post-travel production. So it's, it's been a bit inefficient there. Uh, there are six chapters in the book. Uh, so uh, this explores, it's basically a travelogue. And uh, the first one is along the Silk Road, uh, right from uh, Luoyang uh, in the north uh, uh, eastern China, all the way down to Kashgar. The second one uh, explores the north-south trading route all the way from Beijing in China to Mongolia, uh, ending at Ulaanbaatar and passing through the states of uh, Shanxi, uh, places like the Tong. The third one takes us uh, along the southwestern part of China, the lovely provinces of Sichuan and, and Tibet. The fourth uh, explores where uh, we are all sitting right now, albeit virtually Hong Kong, the southeastern part of China, starting from Chanjiang and Guangdong province, Hong Kong, Hang Hangzhou, Suzhou, Shanghai, Taipei, uh, uh, Kaohsiung, all in Taiwan. And, and the fifth uh, enters the land of morning calm in, in Korea. And uh, the sixth, the last but not the least, is the land of rising sun. So the story in the first chapter begins with uh, Shaolin, uh, Luoyang, and, and uh, then it goes to Xi'an, Dunhuang, Turfan, Wulumchi, Kashgar. One of the most uh, uh, symbolic stories of the whole book is this one that you're seeing. The, the place is Luoyang, and we are uh, back in time to AD 67. And the then Chinese uh, emperor called Ming Di of the Eastern Han Dynasty uh, sees a, a golden angel in, in his dream. The next morning, he summons all his ministers and say, tell me, tell me, what is it that I saw? Who's that golden god? Uh, they all reply, sir, we know it is the Buddha in the West. He says, get me some more information. And so uh, out go the Chinese envoys, and they reach north of India. Uh, technically, today it's Uzbekistan. The valley is called Fargana, where which was a major Buddhist center as well. And you can see in this image there are these two Indian monks, the bald bearded ones, who are then invited by these envoys, and and their names are Dharma Ratna 
and Kasapa Matanga. It's, it's a tongue twister because these are Sanskrit names. Dharma is religion. So Dharma Ratna, Ratna is a jewel. And, and Kasapa, and they're coming back on the white horse, uh, along with the white horse, with the idol of Buddha that you can see, which symbolizes all the sutras and scriptures in the Buddhist literature, which they brought back, along with the white horse. And they enter Luoyang, where the emperor builds a beautiful temple for them. And that temple stands still today in its modern Aftar. And that's called the Temple of White Horse. Uh, it's, it's also called Bai Ma Se in Chinese. And, and these two gentlemen, they died there, their tombs are there, and people come and pay their respects even today. And when you see them and you see the paintings and all the work that they did, you feel we must be talking about maybe early 20th century. It's that beautifully preserved. Uh, Longmin grottoes, uh, also near Luoyang, are uh, one of the three famous grottoes uh, in China. You have the Yungang grottoes, which I'll show you later. So these are very near Luoyang, and, and in the middle, uh, you can see the big Buddha, uh, who some say resembles the, uh, the only and the most famous empress of China, uh, Wu Zetian of the Tang Dynasty, because she heavily patronized Buddhism. And, and this image has been made to resemble her, to give her uh, even more bigger aura. Shaolin, I mean, the world knows Shaolin, I really don't have to introduce as a, as a center of the Chinese Kung Fu. But what is less known is uh, how it was established. Uh, uh, the temple was established by an Indian monk called Batuo. And in fact, Batuo is the Chinese name. And we have lost uh, the Indian name of this monk uh, due to, because it was close to 500 or 499, 498 AD when it was set up. But the monk who is more well known as sort of the founder of Shaolin is Damo, uh, as he is called in Hong Kong and China. And his Indian name is Bodhi Dharma. And Bodhi Dharma came from the South Indian state of uh, Tamil Nadu today, a place called Kanchipuram. And he was actually the son of a king. He was a prince. And he gave up all the material possessions to spread the good word of Buddhism around. And he's also considered as the founder of the Chan sect of Buddhism, as it is called in China. Uh, Chan, the word Chan comes from the word Dhyan in India. And Dhyan means to meditate, to concentrate. And this uh, same phrase took the name of Zen in Japan. Uh, and, and you can see in this picture that uh, the Kung Fu is very similar to the South Indian martial art of Kalari Paitu from Kerala, which, which Dhamma or Bodhidhamma introduced there and which has been very beautifully developed. And you can see these shots uh, from the Shaolin Temple. We then come to Xi'an and this is the most famous pagoda called the Big Wild Goose Pagoda or Dayan Tha in Chinese. And this is the place where the famous traveler, scholar, writer, uh, called Zhuangzang in, in China. In, in India, we call him as Wenshan. He embarked on his 17 year old, 17 year long travels from 628 to 645, passing through the Silk Route, entering the north of India. Uh, often he came close to death, the kind of dangers of the, crossing the Gobi and Taklamakan. But he returned back after traveling all across, all through India with uh, lots of sutras and established a sutra translation institute in this lovely pagoda. And he impressed upon the emperor to build a stone pagoda so that these sutras can be preserved. And on him is in fact inspired by his work called Records of the Western Region, uh, was a Chinese fictional literature called A Journey to the West. And in fact, this book's title is inspired by this, but it's A Journey to the East. So here you can see in the famous epic Chinese work, the fictional work, which was done by Wu Chenggen in the 16th century in the Ming Dynasty time, uh, there are three animals. There's the Chinese monkey king, there is the buffalo, and there is the pig who accompany Shan Zhang, the character depicting Zhuang Zhang. And Sun Wukong uh, is the Chinese monkey king. And look at his resemblance with the Indian monkey king, uh, who is called Hanuman uh, in a major epic called Ramayana. And I'm happy to share this, that this picture was taken very much at the Asia Society by me in 2015, when, when this Chinese traveler called Hong Mi came to, did a talk on a book, which was about her travels into India. And also Tom Carter can be seen, her boyfriend who was a photographer. And we then come to this famous pagoda called Famensa in Xi'an. 
Uh, this place, a lot of relics of Buddha have been found. You can see some of the caskets down below. And these were sent by the famous Indian emperor called Ashok, who is also called as Ayuvang in China. And there's a whole treasure trove of gold, ornaments, silver, which has been found under the temple uh, in 1987, because the Tang dynasty emperors used to patronize uh, this, this uh, pagoda, and the relics would be taken out in a procession, and all the gifts would be given to the priests and the monks. We now come to Dunhuang, uh, close to the Gobi Desert in the Gansu province of China. And it has uh, a set of five caves, but the most famous uh, set of caves are called as the Magao Caves or the Magao Ku, which has something like 735 caves. And this place, in its, when this was set up in fourth century, would have been somewhat like Hong Kong, a major metropolitan city where, you know, the Charians, Chinese, Indians, Mongolians, Sokthians, all these people lived together and, and they practiced Buddhism and also gave comfort to the travelers. And this is one of the most beautiful caves in Dunhuang uh, called the Nirvana Pose of Buddha, where you can see frescoes in the background, apart from the statue, the lying statue. Uh, they say this is the posture in which he took his heavenly abode. We come to Turfan the, the, in Xinjiang province, uh, and you can see the double humped Bactrian candles, which would ply on the Silk Road. And Kashgar, finally, right across the Himalay, uh, across the Indian uh, area of Ladakh and, and uh, Kashgar was a famous silk city, yeah, famous for its cattle market, also called as Kashi. And there is a Kashi in North India also called Vanarasi, is also called Kashi. So look at the similarities. And the lovely people of uh, 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 Xinjiang province, the Uyghurs, you can see. The next second chapter now begins from Beijing all the way to Mongolia, as I mentioned. This is the statue of Song Kappa in Beijing in the, in the Lama temple. It, the journey starts from here, moves to Taiwan, then goes to Datong, finally the China-Mongolia border at Zaminud, and then the Trans-Mongolian uh, Railway uh, takes us to Ulaanbaatar. So we start here with Zhuang Kongxi or the Hanging Temple, built almost 1500 years back uh, by the dynasty called Northern Wei Dynasty. It hangs 50 meters above. And apart from having the Buddhist uh, uh, statues, it also has Taoism and Confucianism. So, so all the travelers who would uh, carry the trade from, uh, uh, you know, Mongolia to China would, would, would rest here and pay their obeisance. And this is the famous Wu Tai Shan. Uh, Wu Tai Shan uh, is, is one of the four most holy sites in China, in, in, in Buddhism. And uh, uh, this is uh, famous for worshipping of Manjushri, or in, in, in China, she's called Wenshu. This is the Bodhisattva of learning. And uh, Wenshu or Manjushri has a sword in the right hand, and he has a, a holy sutra called Prajna Paramita Sutra in the left. And that dispels and cuts the darkness of ignorance uh, with the light of transcendence. And, and illuminates the minds. And they say that Mao Zedong, before he took over uh, on the 1st of October 1949 as the premier of the People's Republic of China, he even came here and paid his respects okay, as for the uh, Mr. Lokesh Chandra, who's written the foreword to the book. We then move to Yungang Grotos, again built by this Northern Wei dynasty. In fact, which is also a dynasty which is Mongolian in origin. The Tuobas came from Mongolian side. So it's not just Kublai Khan or Cengiz Khan, but you know, like India, China has also had a lot of influences from outside. And they built these gigantic grottos, which are very famous for the beautiful statuary inside, as you can see in this particular cave temple. And look at the resemblance with uh, north of India in the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, you know, the Ladakh. They, we have these beautiful similar caves. And uh, in fact, there are many Buddhist scholars who went from Kashmir to Xinjiang. And there was a lot of communication between these two regions. We now come to Mongolia. And, uh, uh, you know, the phrase Dalai Lama was coined by the Mongolian king called Altan Khan when he met the famous Buddhist scholar from Tibet called Sonam Gyatso in 1578. And Altan Khan was a descendant of Kublai Khan. And, and uh, so he gave him the title of Da means big, uh, Lai means ocean, the wisdom of ocean. And he was anointed as a third Dalai Lama. 
So we now come to the third chapter. We move from uh, the famous, we move to the famous Dafo of Lershan, uh, which is in Sichuan. This is the world's highest rock cut Buddha standing even today after the Buddhas of Bamiyan were completely destroyed. And uh, this is something like 71 meters high or 233 feet located at the confluence of three rivers. It's a world heritage site. And uh, it was commissioned in the early part of 8th century. Uh, would have taken almost 100 years to build this gigantic structure. Now, look at the resemblance once again uh, in Ladakh with, with, the, with the grotto, with this image of Mulbek. Now, sadly, much of the other higher statues in India in the north have been destroyed because of invasions. But we still have some of these remnants which can be appreciated. We now come to the second holy site of out of the four in China, which is called as Ermishan. Now, Ermishan is again in Sichuan province, and here they worship the form of Buddha called as Pukshian in China, or in India, it's called as Samanta Bhadra. Now, what this means is the Buddha that represents the uh, virtues of truthful action, righteous action. Uh, the other two holy sites I like to mention in China for, for, uh, from Buddhism perspective are the Putuo Shan. This is near Shanghai. And here they worship Guan Yin or the Bodhisattva <laughs> of compassion. And Guan Yin is the female form of what we call as Avalokiteshvara, which is, as I said, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And notice that the word Putuo resembles the P Potalaka Palace in, in Lhasa and also uh, these two uh, places are named after Potigai Hills in South India. So the word Po comes from there. And these hills in South India, in Tamil Nadu state I mentioned before, are famous for the abode of Avalokiteshvara. So uh, we move on to the famous uh, roof of the world, the Kailash Parvat, called Kang Rinpoche, or Snow Jewel in Tibet, autonomous region of China. And you can also see the famous lake called the Manasarovar Lake, or Mafam Yumso. Now, this is a very holy area for four religions, for Hinduism, because it's considered as the abode of Shiva, the destroyer. It's also very holy for Buddhism, as also for the Jain religion, and for the pre-Buddhist religion in Tibet called the Bon. And mind you, four rivers which breed a significant part of Asian civilizations uh, are born here, particularly the Indus River, on which India is named in English the Satluj, the Brahmaputra River, which in China is called the Sang, uh, uh, Sangpo. And, and there's another river called Karnali. And of course, Tibet also uh, has given birth to Mekong and the Yellow Rivers. We move to the southeastern part of, uh, of, of, of China, and we start with the beautiful city of Hong Kong. Uh, this is how some of these cities in the Silk Road would have looked 2,000 years back in time, since the high rises, but, but the, the old Aftar. Of, of a metropolitan, cosmopolitan, multinational community. And you all know the Tian Tian Buddha in Hong Kong, but what I like to mention that this bronze statue standing 23 meters high was inspired by the Dafo uh, of Lershan that you saw. So when this was commissioned in the early 90s, and this was still with the Britishers at that point of time, and Chris Patton was the, the governor, uh, they sent the monks from Polin Monastery near Tian Tian Buddha to Lershan, and also to a place called Kamakura in Japan, because there again, there was a beautiful bronze statue of Buddha, which I'll show you subsequently. We come to Hangzhou, where this uh, famous Lingyan Sea Temple is there. And this is famous, of course, for the West Lake, and also for the lovely canal, which connects it all the way to Beijing, running 1600 kilometers, again, a world heritage site. But this mountain in which these grottoes have been carved is called as the Fei Lai Feng in Chinese. And this means basically the peak which came flying from the West from India. And this is named after what is called as the Vulture's Peak uh, in Bihar, in, in the, the state where Buddha uh, attained enlightenment. And, and this Vulture's Peak is the place where Buddha gave his major sermons, the global sermons. Right, so, so in recognizing that this place has been named as Felai Feng. And of course, the lovely cities of uh, garden cities of Suzhou and Shanghai, where the architecture, the lake, uh, the gardens uh, 
you know, bring in that lovely harmony which is needed for us to spiritually connect with nature and with God. And we come to the famous Longshan Temple in Taipei. And this is uh, in the Snake Alley. And this was a temple which was really bustling with lots of activity as I saw it. And there were people throwing the yin and yang as they do in Hong Kong temples as well. Uh, we move on to Tainan. Uh, which used to be once the capital of uh, Taiwan, I believe, when the, the Qings took over the Mings in China, the Koxia, they, he ran away and he came to uh, Taiwan and he established himself, his fort is still to be seen in Tainan. And in fact, after Tainan, the word Taiwan came, uh, as they say. And there's some lovely temples, Buddhist, Confucian, all kinds of temples here in this lovely, small, uh, cute city. Moving on to Foguangshan uh, in Gaoxiang, which is the port city of Taiwan. And I wish to tell you that there's not just an old Buddhist temple here, but they made a beautiful modern complex here uh, in which there are museums and art crafts on display. And there are these paintings which are on display, which bring out the essence and tenets of Buddhism. And I'd like to share this one with you where you can see Buddha in the orange robe. And if you see the little uh, lady, uh, there's, there's a lady in green with a little boy who's dead. And she comes grieving to the Buddha that, you know, uh, please revive him. You know, he's dead and she's mourning. Uh, Buddha tells her that, all right, uh, I will help you. Uh, please try and get a most common grass in India. It's called the Kusha grass from such a home, which has not seen death. So she goes house to house looking for, you know, that grass. The grass is there, but she just doesn't find any home which has not seen death. So she comes back after a while to Buddha. And she says, I've understood, you know, she understood that death is as inevitable as birth and she stops grieving. There are many other more beautiful such stories depicted pictorially in this lovely place of Foguangshan. We come to the land of uh, morning calm, uh, uh, the Korea, which has some beautiful temples and temple stays. And I managed to do a, a, a few of them in this uh, country. We, we start with Byomyosa located in South Korea near Busan. And uh, now many of the Korean uh, monks and scholars also went to China and, and uh, brought the relics of Buddha as well as the sutras and scriptures. And, and there is also evidence of a direct communication between India and Korea. Uh, so there was all kinds of bilateral movements happening. Uh, so this particular temple that you're seeing was built something like 1200, more than thousand years back uh, when the Shilla dynasty was uh, there in Korea. Uh, now, Bulguksa, another world heritage site, uh, has these famous four lion capitals, uh, which, were, which are associated with the Ashok, the King Ashok. And uh, uh, so you could see them inside the Bulguksa temple. And, and now I come to Hainsa. Now, Hainsa, uh, again, in South Korea, is a world heritage site temple. And it's a world heritage site because this has the world's oldest book ever written on wooden blocks, preserved beautifully for last more than 1,000 years. In fact, these are 84,000 wooden blocks, which are each of which is about uh, one and a half feet to two feet tall uh, in length and about one, one feet in height and about a couple of inches in width. And it's etched on the wood, the Prajna Paramita Sutra uh, in the Buddhist uh, you know, scriptures. And you can see this is preserved beautifully in, in the temple there uh, without any air conditioning facilities, uh, you know, a, over a period of 800 years. And that is what has got it the status of World Heritage Site. And the hills around Hainsa are called as, in fact, Gayasan. Now, when I heard the word Gayasan, I thought it sounded Korean. But later, while staying in the temple and reading a book there, I discovered that, you know, San is, of course, Shan, a mountain, and Gaya is actually Gaya in Bihar in North India, uh, where uh, Buddha attained enlightenment under that Bodhi tree. So inspired by that, these hills in Korea are named as Gaisan. We come to uh, Siokuram, again, a world heritage site, and this overlooks uh, Japan, the uh, Sea of Japan, so probably to protect them from attacks coming on from the eastern, far eastern side. Uh, we now enter the land of rising sun, which probably has some of the finest world heritage sites all in one little city called Kyoto, to which some of you must have been to. And this is the famous golden pavilion in Kyoto called as King Kakuji. And this comes belongs to the same sect of Buddhism as the Chan or the Dhyan and therefore the Zen. Uh, th this is the iconic Kyomizu Dera uh, uh, temple in Kyoto. And this is 
this image of this temple is in fact used in many of the the Japanese pictorial representations uh, of of the country. Uh, again, a major Buddhist temple. Uh, we now come to Nara, and much before Kyoto uh, became the capital. Uh, Nara was the first capital, in fact, from roughly 700 AD to about 775 AD. And in this temple called as the Temple of Todaiji uh, stands uh, the, the uh, Nara's Buddha, as it is called. In a, it's, it's, it's the world's uh, highest wooden pavilion in which a Buddha statue of this height is, has been consecrated. And this was commissioned in 775 AD. And there was an Indian monk called Bodhi Sena who was invited by the Japanese envoy to China. And this Indian monk Bodhi Sena was present in Wutai Shan, the, one of the four holy sites I showed you. And the Japanese envoy was visiting and the Japanese emperor was looking for some learned scholar to consecrate the statue. So Bodhi Sena came all the way from Wutai Shan in China to, to Nara and opened the eyelids of the Buddha statue. And thereby this was commissioned. Interestingly, Nara ceased to be a capital when after a major plague pandemic hit Japan. And this is around 775 and the emperors decided to shift it to Kyoto. I mean, uh, pandemics have always had, had like the pandemic we are currently in a profound impact on, on uh, you know, the world's history. And we come to Koyasan where uh, there are a series of Buddhist temples, 52 temples even today offer homestays. And here, the Japanese emperor sent the famous Japanese monk, scholar, diplomat called Kukai or Kobo Daishi to China to learn about Buddhism. And he went to no other place, you guessed it right, it's Jian, uh, as it was, it was called Chang'an at that point of time. And he was commissioned to spend 20 years and he learned Buddhism in the sutras in just two years time, sharp that he was from a Chinese teacher, Buddhist teacher called Huigo and Huigo, was actually a disciple of three Indian monks called Amoga Vajra, Suva Karishma, and Vajra Bodhi, who brought in what is called as the Vajrayana form of Buddhism into, Ch into China. And that Vajrayana, or it's also called as a thunderbolt vehicle of Buddhism, you know, was became known in Japan as the Shingon school of Buddhism. So uh, we, we were lucky to do uh, a temple stay in this lovely place called Renge Join. And you can see a character etched uh, with sand on, the, on this gravel. And this is a character in Sanskrit, and it means Buddha meditating in the middle of a lotus flower. Miyajima uh, near the uh, Hiroshima, with, here the, I saw the, the uh, Japanese form of the, the goddess of learning in India, whom we call Saraswati. In Japan, she's called as Benzai Ten. Uh, she's also seen uh, playing the stringed instrument like Veena in, in, in Japan. Similar instrument, you can see Benzaite playing. And this is the famous Daibutsu of Kamakura. And this is the place you may recall the Tiantian Buddha, uh, the Poland monastery monks. They came here and, and this is an open air bronze statue close to about 13 meters high, built around the 13th century. And Kamakura was the capital of the shoguns of Japan, you know, the army general Asimos, uh, because they ran a concurrent, they were a concurrent power center. The, 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 the power on paper belonged to the emperor in Kyoto, but the shoguns wielded the real power and they had their own dynasties. So the shoguns decided to build a grander statue of Buddha than the one in Nara. So to out, outsmart them, they built this one. The, the temple complex of this uh, uh, Daibutsu has long withered away. So this therefore stands in open air and the green color is because of the oxidation of copper. This is the iconic uh, temple called uh, Toshuku in Nikko, north of uh, Tokyo. And here you see the very famous three monkeys, uh, see no evil, hear no evil and speak no evil. And as some of you may know that Mahatma Gandhi uh, these, these later came to be known as Gandhi's Three Monkeys because he started the famous non-violence movement uh, and the Satyagraha. And, and uh, so right thoughts, right speech, right action, which, is, which are the core tenets of Buddhism, uh, were in fact an integral part of the non-violence movement of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, it was in fact a Japanese monk scholar by the name of Fuji-san who first mentioned about them to Mahatma Gandhi. And the gentleman who has written the foreword to my book, who is an Indologist and also decorated with the title of Padma Bhushan, the, the 
third highest civilian owner in the country, has has mentioned that in fact it was his father, again an Indologist and a Buddhist scholar, uh, from whom Mahatma Gandhi asked more about uh, the meaning of the monkeys. So with this, I, I almost come to the conclusion of this presentation, showing you some images from the Buddhist tea ceremony, which we had the pleasure of having at Byomyosa in Korea. You know, before anything else, uh, they first did this. The first cup of tea was offered to the Buddha, as is the East Asian tradition. And uh, 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 on the on the left are the images from uh, Ulaanbaatar. Uh, on the right. Uh, these are the Matsuris, the, the festivals uh, in Japan, where they take out chariots, much like the chariots taken out in Eastern India, processions with uh, uh, you know, musical instruments being played uh, inside the chariot. But there is uh, shamisen, uh, you know, urhu, uh, the drums, and uh, uh, getting up in morning, you hear these beautiful sounds, and I sort of rushed from where I was staying to you know, be a part of this convoy. And the first thing they offer, I thought it was going to be a nice morning cup of tea, but it was actually soju and uh, a delightful uh, sake, sorry, sake. Uh, soju is the Korean version. And uh, on the bottom is the picture of uh, a, a whole group, which I had the privilege of leading to the world's toughest pilgrimage. Uh, it's the Kailash Mansur over in Tibet. And this is organized by the government of India with support from the government of China as a, as a collaborative venture. And it goes uh, and crosses from India to China at a height of 5,200 meters, a uh, pass called the uh, Lipu Lake. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I've been able to give you some flavor of, of, of the book. There are close to 100 destinations, which have been uh, 98 to be precise, which are covered in this book, spread over 37 major cities scattered over China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Mongolia. And the underlying theme, I feel, is that of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, means the whole world is one single family. Thank you very much for, for being online. Uh, over you. to you, Sarah. Thank you for taking us through that. Um, maybe we can start with how did you, how did the idea for this book come about? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah, thank you for asking that question. The book was never really conceived uh, in the way it is. it has eventually come out at the starting of these travels. The first travel was undertaken in 2009, you know, the one to the Kailash, to Tibet, which the last shot showed that uh, group of people. And uh, then the travels went on when I was in Hong Kong from 2012 to 15 as a diplomat, uh, either in my personal capacity or sometimes for official meetings. But... Over the period of six years, gradually, I started finding this pattern of harmony, of so much of cultural exchange, which has happened over the last 2000 years between our civilizations, that I thought even educated people uh, across the world would not know much about it. And therefore, I felt a need to document it. I mean, uh, look at the way the Tiantian Buddha is made, inspired by the Lershans Buddha and the Kamakura. Huh? Or look at... When I was at, uh, in Taiwan in, in that Foguangshan temple complex, I suddenly discovered that uh, in Xi'an, you know, they had a presentation on Famensa Pagoda in Xi'an. And that pagoda broke in 1987. And when it broke, they, the government officials tried to dig and make it strong. And when they dug the soil, they found a huge treasure trove. They found Buddha's relics. So I read about it in, uh, in, in the museum in Taiwan. And as it happened, I came back to Hong Kong. Within a week, I was in Xi'an. And I saw that beautiful Famensa Pagoda. And, and I realized in Xi'an that Famensa was initially called Ashoka's Pagoda after the great Indian emperor. So I started finding these beautiful patterns of you know, uh, interconnectedness between our regions of India and East Asia. And so it's only the last trip, you know, the one which I undertook to Dunhuang, Turfan, Kashgar, and Volumchi, you know, these lost cities of Karakoja and Yarkoto, which were major Buddhist centers in, in, in Xinjiang. It's only that trip, uh, which I, I must confess that I had this uh, contours of the book in mind, you know, and I thought the Silk Road would not be complete. The book would not be complete if I did that travel. So, so it's 2015. And then, of course, hats off to my publisher who, who, who bought the idea and came out with a mix of pictures and travelogue. And... It sounds like you've been traveling for so long. How has your relationship with travel grown over the years? 
so uh, i think travel uh, there's an old indian saying that if you want to become a wise man you must travel you know travel makes you acquire not just knowledge but also wisdom and let me elaborate this a little more initially you see people like to travel as a getaway from their day to day lives right have a break right but when you really start traveling in the true sense you start uh, getting exposed to other cultures to other geographic uh, forms you know uh, flora fauna uh, you know you start getting exposed to history you you start realizing that our lives individual lives the materialistic routine lives are but a tiny speck in the larger scheme of things you know in the larger the the business of earth and all its occupants and you also start feeling connected with all other inhabitants on the planet you know the other nations the citizens the 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 uh, all sentient beings in that sense you start gradually transforming from viewing travel as a getaway to travel as the mainstay and long after you've stopped traveling you know you retain that spirit of oneness with with humanity and and i think that is the biggest uh, 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 takeaway of traveling which which i have experienced and you you no longer feel you're alone uh, you are part of the whole and it also helps you give a, a greater impetus to your daily life whatever profession you are in you start viewing it differently you start looking at it what can i do to create a lasting impact on the soil before i call it quits because our lives are a tiny speck in the larger scale of time yeah it sounds like you visited many different places so even within the remote regions and those kind of hidden cultures then what's the important of the importance of the cultural exchange between everyone so i think uh, in a way it's it's uh, related to the to the previous uh, aspect of travel when you when you move you you realize that you know uh, these different cultures have been existing some of them may be uh, quite different from your own culture some of them as i discovered in this case uh, has had these strong interconnections right so again it it once again helps you uh, either acquire more knowledge in terms of better best practices how differently you can do the same things or it helps you in getting uh, more and more integrated in uh, in the in the theme in the ancient indian theme of vasudeva kutumbakam vasuda means the whole planet and kutumba means a family so whole whole planet is one family how do you think during these isolating times all everyone's quarantining or self isolating how do we continue this cultural exchange and learning so uh, i think obviously uh, physical travel uh, has been affected but i think uh, virtual travel and there's no better forum than than reading reading is literally uh a travel at a much higher velocity than than the physical travel you can cross time spaces you can cross ages you can go back in time so i think it's very important for all of us to to be aware of uh, uh the the you know uh, other cultures through through reading and which is um, uh, has soft to asia society for organizing this joyful reading theme to promote this better understanding of cultures and on the other hand i feel uh it's it's important to have the takeaways from our lives uh either through the previous travels or through our reflections you know uh and imbibe those into our daily routine you know those practices of say yoga or meditation uh, which help us uh focus our lives which help us uh uh being in more peace and harmony with 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 uh, everyone with the society at large and which would therefore uh you know increase the positive creative forces uh, and and reduce the divisive destructive forces which operate in the human society and what kind of um mental health practices have you picked up along the way then uh so i I've, i've been primarily trying to practice uh, uh you know the yoga yoga and meditation uh, to to whatever extent that i possibly can so the word yoga and we you know we celebrate world yoga day in 21st of june after the united nations uh, thumpingly approved uh, the the declaration of 21st june as, as as yoga day it basically means union so now uh, in common parlance we identify yoga with those bodily postures right and which are basically meant to increase the blood circulation to different organs of the body not very different from i think chi gong or tai chi in china uh but gradually you know uh, uh 
uh, you start realizing by focusing your mind. Uh, let me let me give you an example. There's a posture called the corpse posture. It's called Shavasan. Asan is a the the postures mudras of yoga. In Shavasan, in corpse posture, you lie down absolute flat, and you have to take your mind slowly from your toes of your legs gradually upwards to your knee, to your thighs, to all your body parts, to your hands, and to, so. Whereas the mind is so uh, agile and versatile, it's, uh, you know, all kinds of thoughts come in. So you learn to concentrate uh, the thoughts of your mind to all your body parts. So I think yoga is eventually by cutting out the weeds uh, from the mind, by cutting out the stray thoughts, by cutting out the six vices of anger, uh, hate, uh, greed, lust, and so on. We are basically uniting with, with the whole universe, with the oneness. And in uh, Buddhism, as well as in, you know, the Vedanta philosophy of Hinduism, we call this concept as Shunyata. Shunyata means emptiness, because at the end of it, you know, everything gets destroyed, including a body. So, so the universe, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the whole universe, you have the Big Bang Theory, for example, the, 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 all the planets, they will eventually, the star will finish off and then again. So it's, it's a concept of emptiness and what, or you can call it a concept of oneness because we are no different from the birds or the flora fauna or the animals and forget about boundaries between nations. Even these are artificial at, at a more philosophical and spiritual level. So uh, oneness or emptiness, is that is the concept. And I think yoga and meditation helps us to move in that direction. And this is one thing I've been sort of trying to practice uh, even in the pre-COVID times. And I myself, as you're aware, got affected with, uh, with COVID. And I, I think this has stood the test of time. So could you actually share how you... Um, your experience with COVID-19, seeing as you and your family both caught it um, earlier last year and how these practices actually helped you kind of survive like mentally and physically. Yes, so we had this very interesting relocation from the eastern part of India, city of joy, Calcutta, to the uh, north Himalayan state of Uttarakhand in Dehradun. And uh, one of the perils of a transfer and relocation in pandemic times is getting exposed, so we did. But I think what probably, uh, and it was very challenging, you know, uh, with my 80 plus year old father, but uh, apart from, you know, uh, uh, these, these practices which we were doing before, uh, I, I think uh, being staying positive is a very important part of fighting the pandemic. And there's a lot of, so much of publicity about the ill effects of the pandemic that it has led to a sort of a panicky kind of a psyche in most of us. And I think that's the biggest thing we need to uh, ward off from us. We need to protect us, uh, the society, uh, by staying positive. Uh, so that's one. Uh, of course, uh, one must have the ability uh, to relax, you know, to listen to music, spend some time with yourself. Lots of sunlight, lots of sunlight, vitamin Ds. All the doctors across the world uh, ask you to take those sachets once a week during if you're down with the pandemic. Vitamin C again. And uh, I think in the pre, before getting exposed to the virus, it's, it's uh, good if you have a good immunity, you know, and they talk about the role of spices like cinnamon, like, like garlic, uh, which, which uh, can have uh, boost your immunity. Uh, so so I, I think it is these practices with, with a good degree of living in nature, living in harmony. And, and keeping your mind absolutely positive and having that feeling of oneness, you know, which, which, uh, which also, and also realizing, I, I'm, I'm gonna share this uh, interesting thing which the Buddhist monks do. You know, they, when they sleep, uh, the first thing that they see in morning is actually an image of a skull. And that's hanging right above uh, their feet, you know, on the wall opposite them. And so this may sound like a bizarre practice, but actually, the philosophy is that every morning you need to know, you need to realize that you're going to die one day. So your life is not eternal, right? And that is not meant to instill fear inside you. Rather, it is meant to make the most of your day. You know, you begin your day with the thought and you think to yourself, all right, this is an inevitable uh, foregone conclusion. What can I do to have to add value to life, to add value to the planet? So I think uh, not being afraid of death and having this in mind that, you know, anything that is born has to die one day uh, is also a very important part of, uh, you know, your fight against anything, including the pandemic. In retrospect, then, taking from all of that, what was your biggest takeaway? Uh, biggest takeaway from, sorry, from the 
pandemic the, recovery? Yeah, yeah, from the pandemic and from your experience as well, actually having the virus. So I, I think uh, uh, the biggest takeaway is, is to have a lifestyle which uh, tries to practice mindfulness, as they say. You know, whatever we do, we should dip ourselves 101% in it. Uh, now, a simple thing like brushing teeth. You know, how many of us while brushing teeth, when we are doing it, are actually thinking about the different teeth through which the brush is passing? You know, our minds are often occupied with what happened in the course of day. This is just a mundane example. But you can uh, expand mindfulness to everything. You can talk about, uh, you know, when you're sipping your favorite uh, tea or wine, you're having a chocolate or having a simple meal, having noodles for the meal. You know, are you really relishing every moment of it? Are you thinking about what you're eating? Are you thinking about what you're doing? So I think uh, mindfulness, uh, living with mindfulness is the biggest takeaway. And uh, now that's not very easy to do, as, as easy as it sounds, because you always have these distracting thoughts. Like I mentioned, you have these uh, vices of anger, hatred, jealousy, vanity, greed and lust, you know, all the conversations which lead to uh, these kind of things which will come in your mind. So the practice of yoga, you know, the union with the universe, meditation, mindfulness, if you're walking, you know, if you're jogging and you are out in nature trekking, did you, do you feel the aroma of spring? Do you see the beauty of the flowers? Did you hear the sounds of the magpie robin and those whistling thrushes and, you know, did you observe them flying? You know, so you have to soak yourself in every moment. Uh, I, I think that mindfulness is the, is the biggest uh, takeaway. Do you think your practices, your mental health practices have increased or changed drastically after you caught the virus? Uh, I, I mean, it's not that I wasn't practicing them before, but certainly it's been a reaffirmation and uh, of, of these practices, you know, in the post pandemic phase, I mean, the post infection phase, uh, they were there from before, but I think I'm, my convictions have, have increased probably several times over that it's important in life, uh, not to get swayed away in the daily rut, but to take some time off for yourself to reflect on life, to reflect on the true meaning of life, to reflect on the fact that we're all one, to reflect on the fact that we shouldn't be wasting our time on frivolous and divisive uh, matters, be it between our neighbors, within the family, or between nations, you know. So, so uh, I think it's been a, a, a doubling and a resounding multiplication of, of, of such thoughts, and the endeavor is to practice it more and more. Um, and how does that play into your um, spirituality as well in your daily life, I guess? Like, what is the importance of that? So, uh, you know, I, after doing a bit of yoga in the evenings, I try and meditate for about 15 minutes. And uh, it's always a challenge. Each, each, uh, each day, a session of meditation is a challenge because, uh, as I said, the mind is, is probably the travels faster than the speed of light. So the key is that uh, to, to let those thoughts come in, distracting thoughts, and you watch them like a movie. And you say, yes, they are coming. Don't try to block them. Let them come. And then they automatically start getting a bit diluted. And rather concentrate, if you're doing it in open air, which is what I try and do, listen to the sounds of nature, you know, the cicadas and the, the insects or the birds or, or even, even, even the vehicles moving around wherever you are. Listen to the sounds. And I think a kind of numbness starts setting in the limbs of the body. You know, when the mind is completely devoid of thoughts, so it's completely trying to be a witness to what's going on in life. And at the end of it, I feel that uh, it instills a sense of tranquility, a calmness, a positivity, and you are fresh for the next 24 hours to take on the battle for the next day. And over your travels, I guess, it sounds like spirituality is such an important part of your life. How have you seen that translated into the lives of the people that you've met in the many different regions? So I must confess, when I commenced these travels, I wasn't that spiritually inclined. And even now it's a work, it's, we are all students uh, trying to learn more and more practices. But the beauty about travel, and this takes me back to your previous question of, of what travel can induce and do. Uh, the first trip I mentioned uh, 12 years back in 2009 was this pilgrimage to Tibet, to the roof of the world. But my interest, honestly, was not, not so much in the religion part of the 
of the journey. It was more into the beautiful landscapes, uh, the the Himalayan passes, and uh, you know, uh, getting exposed to the other a new culture, you know, the Tibetan culture, and that was the prime driving force. And of course, photography and travel per se. But over a period of time, uh, gradually, as I have seen, uh, you know, like these uh, interconnectedness, how Buddhism spread all the way from India, how it was developed uh, even more in parts of East Asia, including China and Japan, and how it's still being practiced today. I think the the spiritual part of the uh, component, component of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the daily intake of life has started increasing in momentum. And I find myself now uh, doing more of meditation, which I wouldn't do before, which I do now. And uh, so, so I think it's, it's, it's a work in progress. And I, I, uh, I hope to travel uh, and discover more, more interesting things in life, which I could probably introduce at some point of time. Thanks for that. Um, I think we have some audience questions as well, um, just about your travels. Um, I guess when you're, um, let me just, so, what do you think in terms of travel um, and what people can do when they're approaching a new culture? How can they navigate that as a so visitor? Okay, great. Uh, this is a good question. What I love to do before going to any place is to do a bit of research on the place. And I must confess that Lonely Planets played a, 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 a big role in my, all these travels. I had Lonely Planet for China, for Japan, for Mongolia. But uh, with a lot of information available uh, on, on uh, the net as well, I think it's a great idea to know about the history, the geography, the anthropology, uh, the flora, fauna of that place. And if one can pick a few words uh, from, from that language to strike, uh, to break the ice uh, when you uh, when you meet people and uh, I think it's 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 a great idea to talk to strangers and uh, sometimes it may boomerang they may not respond but many a times they do and I think some of the best friends I made were with these lovely strangers in in, in all these parts of East Asia so so I think the best way to navigate into a new culture is to learn a little before be inquisitive have an open mind uh, you should be willing to to step into uncharted waters you should be willing to uh, to experiment, to explore. I mean, at best, you may not get a response, but if you do, you're very lucky and your life becomes that much more richer. So you sh no, no risk, no gain. And how have you stayed connected to all these people that you've met along the way as well? Oh, you but it's a, any part in that? A tough question. Uh, I still have uh, a lot of friends from the city where you're currently based and I, I do like to stay in touch with them, whether it's Chinese New Year or the other occasions. Uh, but of course, uh, there are uh, people with whom you, you, you stay in touch and there are lots of people whom you meet for the first and the last time. And I think that is the, the joy of travel. And you make such good friends. I mean, I've had people helping me out, walking me in the train station in a sub subway or in a metro in Japan and uh, taking me right to the place where the train would come, you know, uh, all the way dropping whatever they were doing. I know I'm not going to meet them ever uh, after this or I may not be in touch. But, you know, that is the beauty of life. Nothing is permanent. We are all in a temporal state of existence. And nothing signifies and symbolizes that more than that fleeting encounter, the joyful moment which you get in life when you meet somebody. And, and both of you know that we're not going to meet again. You know, when you walk, like us, these Uyghurs in Xinjiang, you know, in the, in the village of Turfan, you know, uh, we went inside some of the homes. Uh, I had with me a gentleman from Hong Kong, Mr. Ashok, Ashok Bansal, who might be hearing this talk. We went together in that trip, the last trip. And, you know, they offered tea, they offered nice little, uh, you know, welcomed us to the houses. We entered as strangers and left as friends, never to meet again. And that, I think, is the beauty of travel. It's a great experience. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience. Where would you recommend to travel for a meditation tour? Ah, oh, it's a tough question. I mean, you um, let me answer it as a little uh, uh, metaphysically, if I may. I think the best place to travel to learn meditation is travel inside your mind. Uh, and by that, I mean, you really don't need to acquire uh, any, any special skill to meditate. What you can do right where you are, if you have a, even an open space, if you've got a veranda, a balcony, a terrace, a garden, 
just step out or even in your nice room with the windows open and just sit in a comfortable posture, you know, the lotus posture, uh, the famous lotus posture of Buddha or the one in which you can, you know, just and just close your eyes or you may not even do that, you know, Dhammo or, or the founder of Shaolin, uh, Bodhidharma, he was called the wall gazing Brahmin. He kept looking at the wall and uh, so that you are rooted in the current and at the same time, you know, you're trying to basically calm your mind. You're trying to make it devoid of thoughts. So if you if you say that, no, no, I'm getting this thought, I'm not able to meditate, it's bad, don't do that to yourself. You say, yes, this thought is coming that I'm sitting in Asia society and I'm having this interaction, but let it let it pass. So I think it's it's a beauty of meditation is you can do it anywhere, anytime, without any technology. But should you want to do meditation in a, in a formal uh, uh, course or a camp, I'm, you can do it anywhere. In the city in which you are, I'm sure uh, uh, you can you can find teachers who can help you navigate uh, through this meditation. Or you can travel. You can come to India. You're welcome. Uh, come to the foothills of Himalaya and uh, the the natural environment, or to the Japanese uh, gardens. You know uh, <clears throat> the Zen gardens. Uh, anywhere you like. You know. I hope I've been able to answer that question. I think so. We have another question. Um, so where where can we actually get a copy of your travel log, your book? Oh, okay. Well, I guess uh, you should get it on Amazon. Uh, Amazon, uh, uh, my, my publisher uh, should have put it on the Amazon Global. So it's available. Uh, if you're in Hong Kong, it's available in Hong Kong and Amazon. I know that for sure. Uh, it's available elsewhere as well in other parts of the world. And uh, if you do take a look at the book, I'll be really grateful if you could share, spare your time, put some comments as well as to what you felt. And bouquets and big bats both are equally welcome. Are you planning on writing another book in the future? Ah, uh, that's a question which uh, is, is the, the toughest one to answer because everybody would like to say yes. But uh, in fact, I was commissioned to do another work in 2012, even before this work was uh, conceived in my mind, but uh, then came this transfer as a diplomat to Hong Kong, and uh, I thought there was too much of uh, excitement awaiting me in the form of these travels, which was subsequently undertaken. So that's a shelf project which uh, I think needs to be revived any time that I possibly can. And uh, there is, of course, more water that's flown down the river as well. So uh, I really don't know when, when, and how uh, one could give shape. But I would certainly love to, if I can, find the time. Do you have any ideas of um, what kind of book you'd like to write as well? Or... <clears throat> so, so this project, this book that I was commissioned to write was on this in this Himalayan state of Uttarakhand itself, uh, because I had done a lot of freelance travel writing on uh, the various places in this particular state. It offers wildlife tourism, religious tourism, leisure tourism, uh, adventure tourism, so so it's it's uh, quite an assortment of things that you could do. Uh, but then you know you could write on uh, you know uh, with the, with the autobiographical touches, or you could you could uh, you know I also worked on the enforcement front, combating cross border crime, and I think there are many exciting tales on that side, uh, which which I'm sure would make an exciting read. Um. Let's see another question in the audience as well. How um, it sounds like travel and culture has made you travel and cultural exchanges made you um, a better person. You've learned so much from them. How do you think we can, as individuals, work to find a better version of ourselves? So I think it's a great question to ask. Uh, uh, so our fundamental challenge, I feel, for all of us is, is to get rid of our egos and to get rid of, of, of uh, this notion that we are very important and to get rid of materialism in our lives. And uh, I think I would like to recall, uh, you know, the tenets, the basic philosophical underpinnings of Buddhism here to answer that question. And these are the famous uh, eightfold path of Buddhism, as it is called. And, and what does that mean? It's not some uh, mumbo jumbo or some sort of a sutra that you need to memorize by heart or, you know, uh, or some complicated thing to learn. It's very easy to practice. And before I start telling you, sharing with you what those eightfold path uh, entails, I want to say that, uh, you know, what Buddha said was that you don't even have to follow me. 
you you can find your own path you uh, experiment like a scientist and uh, come out with whatever works well for you and uh, he also said that each one of you each one of us has the potential to become enlightened and i think the the meaning of enlightenment is not some sort of a magical state that you enter in but it is to be uh, rid of of the ego and it is to be at complete peace and harmony with the entire universe which is the concept of oneness uh, so let's take a look at what the eightfold path is which we can imbibe in our daily practice so it is the right thought you know mind has a key role to play right thought right speech the words you know words are so very important you know we we should be speaking softly not harshly to to people we should think before we speak a, a tough call for most of us i was including me so right thought right speech right action you know from from the thought comes the speech and comes the action then so uh, right effort you know if you if you're convinced about the nobleness of something or the goodness of something uh, please do pursue it put in the right effort right kind of livelihood you know uh, you shouldn't be sort of getting your money by stealing or committing you know or through corrupt practices or to you know so right kind of livelihood right amount of meditation you yes, to to so that you can you know uh, uh, become one with everything and right compassion for fellow human beings for others and finally the right mindfulness you know um, a mindful way of living so i think by by following uh, these principles you know one can sort of uh you know automatically one will become more productive in our work lives you know and you if you're convinced that you are working for this just cause for the right cause you know your efforts will get rebounded redoubled right uh, into that uh, area you know so this is what we say in gita which is one of the holy books in in our country in hinduism which is also a part of the vedanta philosophy which is very similar to buddhism as well it says that you know action our lives must be governed at any moment you know you have to think what is it that i can do and in fact it replies to if you're affected with covid you know instead of panicking i kept thinking all the time on any given day is it uh, what else can i do do i need to consult the doctor have i got the medicines okay uh, am i doing the best that can be done if the answer to that question is yes then i think you have no reason to panic after that come what may it it doesn't mean that you may become well necessarily but certainly you know if your mind is relieved with 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 the satisfaction that you are doing your best you are doing your karma you are doing your duty you know you would be at peace and you would certainly have a much higher chance of succeeding whether fighting a pandemic or doing your job well or bringing up your children better or you know your your uh, your conjugal married life for that matter you know so 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 i think that's what it is Are there any surprising moments from your travels that you've seen where people have been practicing this or um any regions where you feel like these kind of matters or ways of life are more popular in ways of practice I guess <clears throat> So um you most, sorry uh, uh, where you've seen it be the most successful I guess in those that kind of a uh, mental practice those that those beliefs so i think uh, uh, i'll i'll answer that on two planes you know uh, the zen buddhism in japan for example you know zen uh, which is chan in china and uh, which simply means dhyan in india it basically means to meditate right uh, it does not believe in reading long sort of volumes of holy books right all it says is that you can become an enlightened person by just meditating right now i think this has had a great impact on the 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 japanese civilization the zen buddhism because the samurais you know the warriors who would who would fight in japan they would practice zen buddhism so you know they're living in the moment you know so so by keeping the mind tranquil uh, so i think uh, 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 this is one one impact i saw of of uh, uh on the society there uh on a on a lighter note uh i was at this temple in korea in hainsa and uh at about 3:30 in the morning we were supposed to get up which we did and you know the practice uh the buddhist monks in the temple they started uh uh you know uh, hammering those gongs uh you know uh so so the sounds would be generated first sound for all the birds 
the other for all the terrestrial animals, the other sound with different types of drums and uh, for all the aquatic animals. So all sentient beings basically were being reached out to. And then finally, after this initial ceremony in the morning, uh, we went into the main praying hall, the Dayung Jion. And in the Dayung Jion was this giant statue of Buddha. And by the way, Buddha said, never make statues of me. So that's a practice which happened five, six hundred years later after his death. Uh, but nothing wrong in it. If it gives you peace of mind, it's a good one. And then they started prostrating before the Buddha, you know, and so I tried, tried to imitate the monk who was doing it. Uh, so once he went down, hold down and then standing up and again down and standing up and they kept doing it repeatedly. So I, I, I did it for as much as I could. And I felt the effects uh, two, three days down later as well in the night because it gave me all kinds of sweet pain. And I realized that that's a very unique way of staying fit as well. You know, the, the monks, it's like a physical activity. And uh, uh, in a similar context, if you see the Shaolin uh, monks, you know, the, the Kung Fu or the Kalari Paitu in Tamil Nadu, the South India martial arts was basically started by the monks at the behest of Bodhi Dharma to stay fit. You know, otherwise you are completely still. And, uh, you know, so you need to exercise. And in fact, uh, the Shaolin monks have played a great role in political battles which have been fought in mainland China. And I know of sure that the Tang dynasty, when they came, the most famous dynasty in mainland China, uh, from which ruled China from the 7th to 10th centuries, it came up by overthrowing the Sui dynasty. And the Shaolin monks helped the, the founder of the Tang dynasty to overthrow the Sui dynasty. And so the Tang dynasty heavily patronized the Shaolin monks as well. And if you've seen that movie, 36 Chambers of Shaolin, you know, they have this little uh, novice person uh, from a village who has had several of his kith and kin killed by the incoming Manchus, right? That's the movie set in the backdrop of the, the Qing's taking over the Ming dynasty, right? So he wants to avenge the death of his uh, village men and his relatives. So he wants to learn the skills, right? So he goes to Shaolin and uh, it's, a, it's a famous movie. So I think there are very interesting, uh, uh, and there are, there are these uh, emperors. In fact, the Qing emperors heavily patronized uh, the Tibetan form of Buddhism. So if you recall, I showed you the statue of Song Kappa uh, in Beijing at the beginning of second chapter. Now that Lama temple where the statue is located was actually the residence of one of the uh, kings in the Qing dynasty when he was a prince. Uh, I would have his name also somewhere. So, and they also would visit, uh, you know, Wu Tai Shan and uh, pay their respects. So I think uh, uh, there's been a very interesting impact of, of spirituality, of religion on not just the the day-to-day the -day lives of common people, but even in terms of, uh, you know, the ruling class, the, the governance and, and the polity uh, and the emperors and the empresses. You know. Have you seen these changes um, seep into our modern, like daily lives, our modern societies as well? So <clears throat> uh, definitely, uh, there is, uh, there have been changes in our society and the world over, you know, essentially, I mean, spirituality is common to all religions, be it Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, uh, is, is so very important for keeping the world harmonious, keeping the world a better place. And I think whatever we have advanced on these parameters is on account of these basic spiritual tenets in our, all our civilizations. But I think there is a great scope for continuing on this because we are very far from achieving a state where, you know, even the national boundaries, forget about uh, national boundaries, even the boundaries within a particular country, uh, you know, divisions in society on the basis of class, race, ethnicities, religion, communities. I think these are all artificial barriers and, and as also the boundaries between nations, right? So I think we have a long way to go still, notwithstanding all that we have traveled uh, as a humanity. And if you look in the context of uh, the pandemic as, a, as also climate change, as also global warming, as also uh, the recent floods in Australia, last year there were fires there, the, the increasing incidence of we've had cloud bursts in our Himalayan state in India. World over these incidents have, have been galloping with a much faster pace. And part of the reason is we are uh, living selfishly, the human beings on the planet. And we need to be in much more harmony with with rest of the living forms and, uh, you know, plants or animals. Uh, so, so I think 
uh, these principles we need to adapt more and more and uh, uh, lead a, a, a more fulfilling life which is measured not in terms of materialistic success but in terms of happiness index or in terms of mindfulness index or in terms of you know how much we have known each one of us while we've been on the planet what do you think our viewers can um do now to kind of help break down these barriers uh, sorry say that again i, I missed the first think, part what what do you think our viewers now or the people in our lives can do to kind of break down these barriers so i think the first step is to realize uh, that that uh, you know we have a much bigger uh, cause to life life is very beautiful it's not confined uh, to to our workplace alone or it's 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 much bigger it's much bigger it's a gift from god and uh, you know we we need to feel more and more one with all forms of life so number one the realization and number two whatever little that we can do to remember it's again a very simple thing to know like uh, you know i sometimes have a discussion with my wife he says yeah 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 it's it's a very simple thing you've said i said yeah it's a pretty simple thing but the trick and the challenge is to remember it all the time at the in what is called as the the uh, subconscious memory you know a store memory as they say in buddhism you know the seeds have to be so firmly etched in our mind that every time when a when a peer uh, is getting upset with us or is shouting at us how do we reply back what's our reflection is our reflection like a wall on which you bounce a ball so it's going to go back with the same force or we can rise above and and you know a kind of come up with a very moderated response so so i think uh, it's daily practice is is something which we can attempt and uh, it's not in the realm of one or zero we are always in between and we can try and maximize mindfulness living with mindfulness in whatever we do thank you so much for that i feel like you taught us all so much um is there any last kind of things you'd like to share with our audience any last sage pieces of advice <laughs> well uh, i think that i i think i sound like proselytizing or something so <laughs> so no more advice is i just want to say thank you very much it's been a real pleasure uh, being in hong kong virtually after 6 years and uh, uh, this is the theme the enormity of which has dawned on me uh, during the course of my stay in hong kong so it's not something which was uh, there right at the beginning right so so i think we are all students and i'm still a student i have my list of books which i have to read uh, but then you know there is this famous uh, poet uh, philosopher scholar in india uh, not not scholar in the sense of one who is read so he's called kabir and he comes up with beautiful poetry and a very spiritual person and he was a completely illiterate person you know so so he never uh, read anything but his all practices were so spiritual so you don't really have to be a very knowledgeable erudite a well read person to adopt these practices i guess that that would be i think i would i would end on that note sara okay thank you so much and um for your time today and thanks to asia society as well for hosting us and all the support i feel like i've learned a lot and for everyone listening or watching this later you can um get dipankar's book on amazon as well and leave your comments as well on youtube and facebook thank you thank you very much asia society Thank you.